Great job, I could listen to more of that. We're gonna move on to uh, You Can't Do That on Television. And here's a video made by You Can't Do That on Television creator Roger Price, who he lives in the French countryside. Christ, how much did you pay Do you know him? why he, he lives anybody. in the French Wait. countryside? He's a tax exile. Uh, <laughs> all right. Anyway, he That's put not together... That's a joke, it's true. <laughs> Darby was very a, helpful a with this book, by the way. <laughs> very helpful. I'd call him up. What really happened? Yeah. <laughs> 500 bucks an episode when I started. <laughs> Why you? And he was so happy to get that. Yeah, I was. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, he put together a little video about uh, the story of where slime came from. So let's take a look at Roger Price. Hi, Matt. Hi, everybody. Hi, Jerry and Jeff, if you're there somewhere. Obviously, I can't see you. I'm beside the river in France, and the splashing you can hear is my dog splashing down in it. And so, Matt, today you're publishing a book called Slime. That must be almost as embarrassing as to go down in history as the invention of slime being your one great achievement in life. Actually, it sort of invented itself, and I'll tell you how. You see, Slime was similar to the sort of stuff we dumped on the heads of the kids in the British TV series which led to You Can't Do That on Television and from which You Can't Do That on Television was adapted or stolen if you can steal your own ideas. And that was because if we're going to have kids presenting a TV show, the kids at home will like to see the presenting it, like to imagine that they are presenting it, realise that they're not and then feel jealous of the kids on TV. So, the idea was to do something really nasty to the kids on TV. Or maybe it's just like dumping slime on people's heads. So was I the inventor of slime? Well, in the way that an artist who thinks up a work of art and it's then made for him by craftsmen, is the artist who created the work? I suppose I was. But we didn't get round to shooting that scene during the pre-tapes of one week and then it was put off to the next week and the bucket returned to the props department. It was supposed to be sewage and who knows what it was, just a bucket of slops from the kitchen probably. But in the passing week or two, Jeff will tell you how long, it turned green and horrible. And when we came to shoot the scene, at the very last minute we realised that this was not fresh slime. However, time was running out, so down onto the head of poor Tim Douglas, the first kid ever to be slimed, came this obnoxious brew, which had turned green of its own accord, so it sort of invented itself. And very, very smelly. If Tim is still alive and hasn't died from the toxic effects of being slimed like that, he can have my apologies now. So, was I the inventor of green slime? Well, probably. If artists are, then I was. And it's something that boasts to my grandchildren about. Actually, they're probably sick of hearing it. I must say, though, I'm not surprised people haven't got sick of seeing it on Nickelodeon, and I sure wish I had a nickel for every time they dropped slime on someone. But they say they don't have to pay for it. Anyway, good luck with the book, Matt. I hope lots of people buy that. Oh, and y'all, don't forget to watch The Tomorrow People. That's a series I created at Thames also, which is coming back on CW. And they do know about paying royalties. Anyway, bye, everybody. Bye, Matt. Bye, Jeff. Bye, Jerry, if you're there. And buy the book, OK? I couldn't understand a word he just said. <laughs> And a note to Mr. Price, next time, don't record in front of a babbling brook, for Christ's sake. <laughs> all right, here's our panel from You Can't Do That on Television. First of all, uh, Moose was perhaps the most iconic cast member, off-times host, and later creative consultant on You Can't Do That on TV. A big welcome for Christine McGlade. <laughs> Back one more time, ladies and gentlemen, because he was such an integral part of the network, Mr. Jeffrey Darby. <laughs> this gentleman was a writer on You Can't Do That on Television. Please welcome Mr. Bob Black.
This young lady was the drama coach on You Can't Do That on television, who worked with the cast members and taught them, as she said, not to act. Please welcome Carol Hay. <laughs> Uh, I, I exec produced a series called Restaurant Impossible now, and my uh, uh, co-exec producer called me 15 minutes ago, and she said, is Alistair going to be there? And I said, yes. Yeah. She said, tell him I love him. Okay. <laughs> he was another one of the most memorable cast members from You Can't Do That on Television, Alistair Gillis. Big welcome for Alistair. Emily Rosenthal wrote an entire episode, You Can't Do That on TV, as a 15-year-old fan and would later co-create You Can't Reunion Conventions with SlimeCon and with Josh Yon, who will be moderating this panel. So welcome Emily and Josh. Well, this is pretty cool. Hi, everybody. Everybody say hi to the cast and crew of You Josh. Can't Do That on Television. Now, we saw the video with Roger Price a few minutes ago, and Jeff, I want to talk to you first. Kind of bring us through how and why You Can't Do That on Television existed and kind of where the marriage with Nickelodeon came into play. Um, so You Can't Do That on Television was, um, existed because in Canada, in Ottawa and in Canada, uh, you have to sign a pledge with the Canadian Television Commission to be able to keep your license. Um, and they're very serious about it. And so the uh, head of production at uh, the television station said he um, would make a television, a kid's show. Um, he brought Roger over. Uh, we created this television show that was a local show for an hour, which had live contests and phone-ins, and we went out with camera crews and caught people playing jokes. And in the, intermingled in all of that were these sketches, um, these skits. Um, we cut the skits all up. And we gave it to a salesperson, and they sold it to Nickelodeon, and uh, we did it again. And then that's Nickelodeon nice. bought it again, and then said, look, why don't you just make it for us and skip the local show? And that's what we did. That's how it, it's, so it's thanks to law, the Canadian law. See, there's always these boundaries. Everything is thanks to Canadian law. <laughs> it's all these boundaries they could put on you. One of the interesting things about You Can't Do That on Television is that unlike a uh, typical series, there was no casting department per se. Carol Hay, drama coach. All the actors that came to the show, and there were quite a few, came through your hands. Kind of tell us about how that process went. Yeah, when uh, Roger came over from England, he was looking for uh, he was looking for someone who was something like Anna Scher, who had a kids theater in in, uh, in England. And from Anna Scher's theater company, Roger found all the kids that, that he ended up using. So he asked around in Ottawa, and he found me. And I was running drama schools, drama classes. And the kids who were in my classes ended up being on the show. And sometimes Roger would bring the kids in from auditions that he held, and sometimes, what, we just find kids in... Uh, just they would, pluck they would us from our schools. That's right. Yeah, they would right just... Right from uh, yeah. the schoolyard. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or, or in the case of um, Kevin... And it wouldn't Ku happen today yeah, that way. Um, Kevin Kubitschewski was arguing with the... A flight attendant that he was going to be able to get on the airplane without having, an, so he could be an unaccompanied minor. In other words, he could just get on. Um, and Roger was getting on the same plane and accosted and liked the spunk of Kevin Kubitschewski because that's how he ended up on the show. He was met at an airport. If you, Spunky, rebellious, and annoying. We want you. We want you. And uh, <laughs> that's basically it. So, so if you were if you happen to be walking through a shopping mall with Roger, he was always scanning for spunky, annoying children. <laughs> Again, wouldn't happen today. <laughs> wouldn't happen today. He, he'd be in jail. <laughs> All right, two of the most memorable cast members. You guys remember these folks, right? Christine McGlade, Alistair Gillis. Give it up for them. They flew in from Canada along with Carol Hay to be with you guys this evening, so we want to acknowledge that as well. Christine, kind of walk us through what it was like going to work on You Can't Do That on Television. What was a daily, <laughs> Jeff is cracking up, what was a day like? Uh-oh. Uh, uh, first of all, I have to say, that was super disturbing, what Roger had to say about the slime. Like, <laughs> I didn't know that. I did. I did. I did. They told I did me that. it was made of shampoo. So now I know what happened to my hair. Anyway, <laughs> mystery solved. Um... Uh, what was it like? I, I mean, I have sort of just random memories. It was, um, 
Uh, we used to shoot at CJOH, was like this little hokey local television station in you know the suburbs of Ottawa, and they used to shoot this show called Family Brown Country there. So we'd show up for work every day, and the security guards would think we were there to stand in line to be in the audience for Family Brown Country. So we always had a hard time getting in. Um, once we got past security, we would get free donuts. There was an arcade next door. We'd hang out with Jeff and Roger. We'd get drama lessons from Carol. Um, and uh, usually I would get slime or water poured on me at the end of the day. And um, now I know what it was. So. And we were very careful. We made sure that we slimed uh, people either before a coffee break Right. Uh, which so was then we unionized. couldn't have any donuts. <laughs> right. Or, or before lunch so that the crew and everybody could go on, uh, eat their lunch and the kids w were able to shower and we wouldn't lose any time um, with, with changes. And because in the last sliming, there was a fight over that shower. <laughs> there were spots. There were green spots all through that studio, through every corridor. Little spots of green permanently on the white tile. <laughs> that should have been our first clue that there was something wrong with that substance. <laughs> Alistair, I want to talk to you about something, and you and I have talked about this over the years at the uh, SlimeCon events, and you touched on this a little bit in the book. While the show was huge down here, it was a little more subdued in terms of reception up there. At what point did you know, this sucker's big? You know, what was that moment? Do you remember that? I, I don't remember. There ago. wasn't a particular moment. Um, because I joined the cast just uh, in early 1982, I think, just as the show was sold to Nickelodeon. So it w I, there was a, I think we had a sense, I, I don't know, within a year or so that something was cooking more down below the border. So, but uh, maybe what I was trying to get at in the, in the book was, or in, in some of our conversations, was just how maybe the people on the outside or the public would have perceived it. As Christine said, like CJOH was, you know, it was, it, it, the people would have thought of it as a local show and not really been aware that, you know, just to a larger degree that it was doing something different in the States. So we kind of knew that, but, and so, and so it always maintained that actually really, uh, that there was, it was kind of, we knew it had a double life in a sense. It was actually um, fortuitous because that meant that um, the cast and actually, and the television show was actually protected. Um, it was protected because there, you didn't end up with um, too many um, you know, TV moms. You didn't end up with the agents. None of the kids had agents. If they got an agent, we fired them. <laughs> <laughs> and then after we did that once, nobody else got an agent. Um, and that was, so, that was because really we wanted to keep it very uh, intense, uh, very much a, a creative, you know, it's like a writer's room. And seriously, uh, the writers, the rehearsals that we did um, three days a week, Tuesday through Thursday, after the kids went to school every day. They were not, um, and then they had to come from their school, get themselves to the station for rehearsals, and get, there was, we didn't car them, we didn't, they were, it was very important OC to us. OC transpo bus. Yeah, yes, that, it was very important to us that they lived a normal life, and uh, having it really under the radar in Canada enabled that to happen, um, and enabled, we didn't end up with, you know, a bunch of starstruck little monsters. Um, we ended up with a bunch of little monsters, though. Um, and in a I, different kind of In monster. a different kind of way. I think Alistair noticed it was big when he went to the White House. Yeah. yeah. I think that was the turning point. Will you tell that story real quick, Alistair? I've heard that, but would you tell the, uh, the White House story? Well, um, no, well I, I, actually, that was towards the end of my run, so I, I'd already had a taste of it. I probably knew it was a big time when, uh, when uh, I met uh, Kermit the Frog. So we had, uh, so, so I, yeah, I just had the occasion, the, the, the few times that I'd been to New York, most of them were when I was about uh, 13 and 14, and uh, I had um, Jenny Lerner, you remember Jenny Lerner? Uh, anyway, there was a Muppet magazine going, I don't know if we even got it in Canada, but anyway, I did. So that was, I mean, that was, you don't it's get any, time. any bigger than, than the Swedish chef, right? That's right. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and so the White House was a little bit after there was an, they do an annual Easter egg uh, event. And uh, I remember President Reagan wasn't there that year because they had bombed Libya. So that was... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. It was, uh, so check it out, 1985 Easter, somewhere in there. Yeah. Bob Block, I want to talk to you a few moments. You, uh, you were a writer. 
during the what we'll call the Atlantis period. And um, Not- walk me through what, what that was like. Tell me about the writing process through the years of You Can't. Well, actually, I only met Alanis once, but she was, uh, she was after my time. But um, basically, I, I, I was in college at the time, so I did a lot of my uh, writing uh, far away and, and had to send them. We didn't have the internet, so you know, the snail mail had to, had to send the scripts up. Um, but then uh, I did, uh, I had the best, uh, I tell people I had the best summer job ever uh, in 1985 because I actually got to go uh, to Ottawa uh, to the little TV station which looked like a really good TV station to me not having seen one before. Uh, <laughs> looked great, awesome. Uh, and I was kind of the script doctor in 1985 and, and basically um, I would sit in on the read-throughs and see what worked and what didn't and the kids would, would ad-lib uh, changes to the, to the lines. Um, Les Lai taught them that, I think, because he was uh, an expert at it. And uh, basically, if something didn't work, uh, they said, go fix this. Or uh, if we needed more, you know, the, the day was running short, so it's like, hey, we've got the movie theater set for another half day. Write some more movie theater sketches. So, but you told me something earlier about uh, Alanis. Tell me yes, what that well, was. Yes, I did. Uh, I, uh, I ended up... Um, it was one of my sketches that was the one that was the only time Alanis Morissette got green slimed. This man right here. <laughs> Once. All right, we're, one of mine. we're running low on time. I want to talk to Emily really fast because you have a really unique story. Emily wrote one of the most uh, well-known episodes of, of that particular era called Contest. But your story, you weren't a staff writer. Tell me about that. I was 15 years old. It was my favorite show in the world. My brother and I videotaped it every day, watched them over and over again. And I thought, you know, let's tape our own version of the show. So I wrangled my parents and friends, and we shot a three-minute sort of parody, our own version of the show in our house. My dad was Barth. My mom wore the mismatched gloves. We made green slime, and we uh, shot this this video. And I thought, I'd like to send it into the show just so the kids could see it, and they could see what big fans that they have in little Miami Lakes, Florida. And Roger Price, who you saw in the video, wrote me a two-page letter about a month later saying how, how much they enjoyed the videotape and the parody and what a great job we did and invited us to write a script for the actual show. I mean, it was an amazing dream come true. Honestly, it wasn't even a dream because I had never fathomed writing a script <laughs> for my favorite show, but we wrote the script and took the money that they paid us and flew to Ottawa and we actually spent a day on the set watching them tape a couple of scenes from our script and you know, stayed in touch with some and some, you know, still friends to this day. It was an amazing experience. That was a dream come true to actually go there. It was great. Um, you know, I just want to take a second to talk about the initial writing of this because I was involved in first writing the first 65 half hour shows and then the previous number of whatever there were prior to that. And that turned out to be Roger and I sitting in a room and just um, we couldn't leave the room until we'd written so many skits. And that was basically the rule. Um, and we would come up first with the concept for what's the show going to be? What's its theme this week? It's a courage or something. And then we would sit there and we would think of every possible joke we could possibly think of. And we wrote probably twice as many jokes as we actually wrote or showed anybody else because we wrote so many jokes that talk about Erst, forget the unresolved part of that. Um, we wrote jokes, basically unfilmable, but we, <laughs> we would roll on the floor laughing at our own cleverness. I was just going to say, that was, that was the most hilarious thing about Roger and Jeff, was they thought their own jokes were so funny. We and Roger w- would like laugh gleefully and maniacally, and he would always comb his hair when he laughed. Like, like when it was really funny, he'd pull out a comb and comb his hair and laugh. And, and one day we did a whole series on the uh, gentleman who ran the television station. The president of the television company was called Mr. Nichols. So our president of the network was called Mr. Dime. And <laughs> Mr. Dime got locked out of the exec... No, the kids were using the executive bathroom um, and they used all the toilet paper. 
And so Mr. Dime unfortunately ate some ex lax or something. And not, not like there was any toilet humor the, in the show. Right, right. Um, and uh, we filmed him coming out of there putting $20 bills back into his, um, into his wallet and going <laughs> 15, 20, I'll remember this forever because I don't think it ever got to 15, $20 bills. I'll never eat Brad Muffins again. And, <laughs> And the week, and then, so, and we just, we killed but ourselves. that is funny. But, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, we killed ourselves laughing, basically. On May, and then we actually taped that, although I don't think that ever made it to the American version. But it did make it to the Canadian version, but not the American version of the show. Guys, we're running low on time, but I just want to ask this really quickly before we head out. It's been 35 years since the show first came on. What does it mean to be here tonight to you guys? Just right down the line. What, is it what does it <laughs> We have indeed stumped them. Well, no, 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 no. I mean, what does it mean? It's been quite a while. You have this it's, amazing... It's great to be back with old friends, right. uh, which we consider everybody out there to be. Um, and and uh, it makes me feel really old. Um, so when I say old friends, it's because they're actually now old. They're, you know, at the, they're older than... A very nice talk. Yes, right. Um, they're actually... Uh, the people on the stage are now older than when I was making this show. I mean, so, because I was 24 and 25. I turned 25 when I was directing the first season of this show and writing it, so. There was a picture of the cast on the cover of TV Guide, and Jeffrey happened to be in the shot when the photographer took the picture, and he was identified as a cast member right. in the, with, with all the 12-year-olds when he was... <laughs> Guys, we do have to wrap it up. Have a big round, uh, big round of applause for the cast of You Can't Do It On Television. Nice job. Keep it going for Mark Summers. We'll see you after the show. Thank you very much. Nice job. Way to go, Jesse. Nice. There you go, sir. I'm not going to have to be here again. <laughs> <laughs> go away.